Greetings, my name is Michael Earlywine. In this segment of Friends of the 60s, I'm going to talk about rock concert posters, posters from the 1960s, and later uh, the particular work of poster artist Gary Grimshaw. But first, how did I get into loving you know, rock concert posters? Well, it was easy. I had to make some posters for my own group, which was called the Prime Movers Blues Band. And this was back in 1965 is when our band formed. No one else in our band seemed interested in advertising us. So along with being the manager, the booking agent, and the chief cook and bottle washer, it fell on me. I guess my own ambition for the band to be heard made me feel responsible, and I responded by doing the posters. In the beginning, I would make, you know, I would just pencil out flyers or painstakingly use press type to make little one-off signs that we could use and then discard. However, before long, one or two signs didn't cut it, and that left me looking for other ways to get the word out and paying a printer to run off a batch of flyers or posters way back then cost more than we would get paid for the entire gig, which in the beginning, of course, was about nothing. So that wouldn't do either. I ended up turning a small room in the attic of the Prime Mover House, is what we call it, which is located at 114 North Division in Ann Arbor, Michigan, turning it into a little silkscreen shop and this was something we could afford. And so I even built sets of drying racks out of two by two lumber uprights with wires strung across in which I could lay out scores of wet posters to dry. Of course, I knew nothing about making posters, but I soon learned. Why the rest of the band was not interested in helping me do this, I have no idea. It was probably because it would take me too long to get them on the same page. But they did agree to go around town and put the posters up, and that helped a lot. However, our band was so well known locally back then that no sooner than we would put posters up, somebody would take them down and post them in their dorm room or wherever. So that's how I got interested in posters. And that had to be in late 1965 and that went on through the years of, you know, from basically 1967 or on up uh, to 1971. That was when I kind of, when I stopped playing, more or less. And when we played at larger venues, like the Grandy Ballroom in Detroit, someone else would make the posters and our band would be on them. So I began to look at how others made posters. And of course I was knocked out by the incredible posters of one Michigan poster artist, Gary Grimshaw. Little did I know that serendipitously, I was fortunate to be in the same time and space as Grimshaw. And over time, we became friends. Now, I've given you the basic idea. Now, let's fast forward to the 1990s. I had always tried to hang on to posters, uh, those with our band's name on it, or my own, or or even posters by other artists and other bands. When cleaning out an old trunk in the basement one, one year, I dug out an old poster, which turned out to be the first poster that Gary Grimshaw ever made for the Grandy Ballroom. And mine was in mint condition. And I soon found out to my surprise that it was now, now worth you know a couple of thousand dollars. And I had a bunch of other Grimshaw posters that I just saved from different gigs. And before I knew it, I found myself collecting posters. So I'm gonna spare you the whole story because it's long, but over the next 10 years and beyond that, I collected many thousands of posters, including complete sets of what are considered the most important and valuable venues, like, and I'll just name a few here, the Family Dog, which is the Avalon Ballroom, the Fillmore's, the Fillmore Auditorium, both old and the new Fillmore series, the Grandy Ballroom in Detroit, Neon Rose uh, by Moscoso, who's a great artist, 
lots of armadillo from around Austin and, and many others, many others. I even had to buy an 800 pound safe and commandeer an entire room just to store these in. And over time I became a bit of an expert in rock and roll posters. And the worth, they were worth, uh, let's just say, a lot of money by that time. I also started what at the time was the largest website of posters on the internet. internet. It was called ClassicPosters.com. And it's still going today, although I no longer uh, own or run it. Eventually, I tired of collecting, and I sold off almost the whole lot, almost all the posters I own. Not because I did not love the art, but because my posters were locked away in huge safes, and I, I never even took them out. And also because I, I no longer cared for the business part, the, you know, the middlemen dealing posters, with the exception of the artists themselves and, and a few others. However, and there is an however here, I never tired of the poster art, and I love it to this day. I even traveled out to the Bay Area a number of times to interview the great poster artists, and I have written hundreds of articles and interviews and several books on rock and roll posters, and they're available today at this site that I'm showing you. And I am getting to the point of all this. In the end, and looking back, the poster artist that I admire most of all is none other than Gary Grimshaw, you know, homegrown Michigan artist. So this show is about one of the great rock concert poster artists of the 1960s, as I mentioned, the legendary Gary Grimshaw. But first, let me give you a little background. The 1960s, and what we know as the 60s, didn't really start until the summer of 1965 in San Francisco and other places. And it spread out from there across the country. It was a whole new music and dance scene. The Grateful Dead formed in the summer of 1965. And what we call 60s music originally started, at, out there at least, as rent parties uh, by the communal group that was known as the Family Dog. And those parties gradually moved to larger venues like the Avalon Ballroom and eventually the Fillmore Auditorium. And these parties were all about dancing and dance music. It was not until the spring of 1966, though, that the new music scene really took hold. And with the music came posters for the music, at least two a week, one from the Avalon Ballroom and another from the Fillmore Auditorium. They were plastered everywhere, all over town, all over San Francisco also just the Bay Area in general. These posters helped to set the scene as much as the music. They helped to signal a real change from the 1950s. I've studied 60s posters and years ago created the first large poster site on the internet and it's still going today but I no longer run it. It's called classicposters.com so check it out. I wish we had the time and you the patience for me to lay out the whole history of concert rock posters. It's indeed literally beautiful, and it illustrates what the 60s were about to perfection. But here I want to introduce you to the graphics of Gary Grimshaw, whom I consider one of the great 60s artists. But he is not from San Francisco. As mentioned, the 60s may have begun in San Francisco, but its effects were felt all across the country, including where I live here in Michigan. In fact, my own band started at the exact same time as the Grateful Dead, and we had no idea uh, of their existence. Perhaps the best way to get started is just to look at some of Grimshaw's posters, and at the same time listen to an interview of Grimshaw that I did some time ago. Of course, these posters that I'll show you represent different periods in the artist's life. 
and we could also talk about Gary's personal history in life. But for now, just sit back and let's get a feel for his work and take in the interview. So somewhere around November of 64, you went in the Navy. Um, right. And you were in there till 66. What, what time, what month in 66 did you get out about? Um, uh, February, I think. Okay, so early in 66. So you really were in San Francisco when things were just starting to bubble. Yeah, actually I got there in 65. You were there in 65, but my guess would be, but you can tell me that 65 there wasn't a lot so visible as in 66 in terms of the whole poster movement, hippie movement, or or what did you see in 1965? That's an interesting question. I remember going to some uh, some of the very early shows at both the Avalon and the Fillmore. Well, it had to be very early because they didn't do anything until the summer. In June of '65, you know, the Red Dog Saloon thing happened—that the seed poster. Right. But then there was a long hiatus between that, and then the graphics that started to appear were pretty crude uh, to begin with. Right. Because the you know, the family dog, as you know, was like a collective that was trying to pay the rent, and so. So you remember, so you went to some of the Avalon, first there was the Avalon, then there was the Fillmore. Right. And kind of Bill piggybacked on Chet Helms. Did you ever meet Chet? I'm sure you did. Yeah, I have several times, yeah. He was a really nice person. Yes, he is. In my life of poster people, which I told you a little bit about, he was one of the ones that was really special. You know, right. A, a special being and, and generous. You know, uh, in my experience, anyway. And so I interviewed him pretty thoroughly back in the around 2000 or somewhere like that. And he died not long afterward. Anyway, um, okay. So say again. So you went to shows at? Do you remember anything about those, or who played, or how big was it? I mean, how, I mean, how active was it? How many people were already into it? There, there were quite a few. The, the places were full. Well, I remember seeing. Uh, um, the Mothers of Invention at the Fillmore. No kidding. And uh, The Grateful Dead at the Avalon. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember those two shows as spe- specifically in particular. Um, but I had been to several, and, and you know, I, so those weren't the only shows that I saw, but those are the two that were standouts. Right, and did they have light shows that early, do you remember? Yes. Well, they did, so... Light shows and posters. And po- who was doing posters? <coughs> Wes Wilson. Pretty Stanley early Moss West. was I mean, just starting. Yeah, he's just starting. Uh, did you get to know Wes at all? Uh, later I did. Uh, when I moved back to San Francisco in uh, in the late 80s. But in 65, you weren't doing posters? No. Were you doing any kind of art? I mean, obviously you had been doing <coughs> art all your life. Well, actually, I was still in the Navy. And... Um, you know, I had a job, so I'd only get out on, on you know, for the weekends and stuff. Okay. Uh, and, and so what did you think? Since you weren't a post artist yet, when you saw those posters, were they developed enough that, you know, they sparked us like they did after a while? Or was it pretty more like flyers and stuff? No, no, it, it really got my attention. Um, for one thing, they, they were everywhere. Okay. You know, it, when you walk around the city, which I did quite a bit, <laughs> um, they were in all the stores and all the buses, and, you know, every, everybody had them. You can't remember any particular, or can you remember any particular poster that you and I might recognize that became historically part of? But anything that was for the film Warren Avalon, we, we all know those. Yeah, I saw them every week, you know. Oh, okay. every, every week there'd be two new posters every, every, everywhere. Wow. Well, um, and so I can look at the whole... Okay, so somewhere around February you were released, and uh, how long did you stay in San Francisco before you went back to Detroit? Uh, a couple of months. Um, I, I really tried to stay in San Francisco, but I was kind of homesick, and, and there was a lot going on in Detroit. So... Uh, and if I remember, you went back and forth between Detroit and San Francisco. Yeah, I, I, I traveled across the country uh, by car several times. 
So oh. back and forth. Right. And what would you do on either end? Like when you went back to Detroit, what was happening? And if you can remember roughly the time period, uh, that would well, be interesting. Well, in, in uh, late 66 is when I came back to Detroit. Okay. Um, in September. Okay, good to know. Just the end of summer. And uh, I stayed at Rob and Becky's house on Canfield. Actually, it was an apartment. Mm-hmm. And I slept in a living room. And I remember that very well because the MC5 was happening like crazy. And the Grandy Ballroom was just getting started. And uh, So this would be late 66. Right. Yeah. That's so, well, you did the Seagull for like was October or something. September. Oh, you did it in September. Right. Because it was in October. October 7th. Wow, that's right. It was October 7th. So before that, um, and we should get into that at some point. Uh, we've talked about this before, but, but you know, this is a good time to start going into it. How, how, how did, you know, so you were going back and forth, but when you got here, how, how did you, at that some point, you stopped going back to San Francisco and you started to be part of the scene in Detroit and stayed there? Right, well, that started, you know, when I came back and... September 66. Okay. And uh, the artist workshop was going great guns, and Don was just getting out of jail from the Elko on, on his second, second pot bust. Um, and how did you meet John? Uh, I met him at his birthday party. Or, or his, it wasn't his birthday. It was um, um, his release from jail party. Was that the, the one when the, when the MC5 were there for the first time playing, or is that some other one? Yeah, right. Really? But what was that like? That, that went on all day long. That was the, it was the regular artist workshop. Which um, was what? I don't know much about. I'll be talking to John about this, but what was the artist <coughs> workshop? What went on? If These were all-day workshops? Yeah, it was a storefront. Uh, it was a house, but then it moved into a storefront. I never went to it when it was a house, um, but it was a storefront, and... Uh, the the artist workshop had every Sunday it had music all day long and all evening. Music played by whom? Jazz, jazz band. Any people you can remember? Uh, yeah, Charles Moore. Uh, um, uh, but I'd have to look at the flyers and stuff to. And John John would remember a lot of this. I know. Yeah. Had to cross correlate all this stuff. So, so you went to those, and so th- this party, this birthday party, <coughs> was in that storefront. Right, it was it was a getting out of jail party actually, not a birthday party. Okay, getting out of jail party, and this is when John also, uh, you know, f- first heard the MC5. That's when they met each other. Right. And you were you were friends with them, not with him. Right. I was staying at Rob's house and uh, doing working for them. And how did you figure in? When did so you and how, uh, obviously you and John must have gotten along well because if I remember, I used to call him the chairman. Is that right. right or wrong? Is that? Did you do that? I don't know if I ever called him anything but just John. Oh, okay, I think that uh, I'll look in another interview. I think that somewhere you, you maybe he said that. Right. That's, that's possible. Uh, yeah, people used to call him the Pharaoh too. <laughs> that's pretty really good. <laughs> okay, so uh, I guess you first. You, now, did, Bob, did John make the thing at the Grandies happen for you or? Is that something you worked out with the MC5 or Russ Gibb or something well, like that? Or did he actually facilitate your becoming an artist? We, we're going to really want to know how that happened. Yeah, it was, uh, you see, Russ Gibb was very happy to meet me and Rob and, and John because it was, between the three of us, we pretty much were the entertainment for the, the place, you know. Right, which he didn't know about. Which he didn't know about. So, you know, we, we've pretty much filled the, filled the entertainment end of it. Um, and did he, did, do you guys get paid? I know you got paid a small amount for posters, but did John ever make any money, or did he just do that? Uh, gee, I don't know, see, because I, I I didn't keep track of all that. All right, sure. Um, but he did, and he can tell you. Um, how, did it, how did this... The Seagull poster was the first one you ever did for the Grandy. Right. There weren't any trials or tests or... No. And how did that come about? I mean, how did how did you get drawn into that? Because you, you were an artist, but you weren't a poster artist, or were you by that time? No, I had never done a poster. 
Wow. And, uh, I, I was just pr- hanging out at Rob's house. Right. And, and Russ and him were on the phone all the time. And he was asking Rob, well, do you know anybody who know, designs posters or knows anything about light shows? Or, and he just handed me the phone and said, this calls for you. Wow. Because he knew that I, I, had, I was an artist and that, um, and then I just came back from San Francisco and was telling him about the light shows and everything there. But when you said you were, told him that he knew that you were an artist, what did he know about your art? Because did he know you were like Gary Grimshaw or did he know that you were just a friend of his that knew a bit about graphics? I mean, had he seen the kind of stuff you could do or, or would do or, or, or was there nothing to show him at that point? Rob and I had been friends all the way through high school. Oh, okay. For about, we, we already knew each other four years by the time, you know, the MC5 started. So he had seen your work? Yeah, he had seen my work and I used to hang out at his house too. And what would that work that he saw, what was that like? Would that have been stuff for high school, this or that? Give me any idea of what he would have, what you would have been doing before posters. Well, my main thing was drawing cars and, and ah. his main thing was drawing cartoons. Oh, so, he was, uh, he, he could do that. Us, we, we, uh, I, I tried drawing cartoons, and he started drawing cars, and so it, it, we, we just worked together, you know. And this was independent of Mouse. You guys d- did or did not know Mouse at that point? Mm, we had heard of him. But you hadn't seen his cars? But, no. Wow. So Okay, so he knew, knew your work. H- how much were you, when you started to do a poster, how much were you remembering or inspired by what you had seen in San Francisco in terms of posters when you began to do one? Uh, a lot, actually. The first one is very much a, um, a San Francisco type design. Any particular artist that inspired you from there? Mm-hmm. No. Now that I look at it, back at it, I, I keep thinking Wes Wilson. That it, you know, Wes's early stuff was very much like that. It was um, strong, yeah. But um, I, 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 Stanley Mouse was. An up and comer in the in the poster business, you know, and and uh, I was a big fan of his. So you'd seen you'd seen his work by that time, right? And and probably Alvin Kelly's and stuff like that, right? Oh, well, that was pretty cool. But you know, the seagull doesn't really look like anything from out there. It's kind of, I guess it's this Gary Grimshaw, right? Um, and then how did? What did Russ say? Just go ahead and do it? How, how did you, so you talked to Russ on the phone, and how did the poster come about? Yeah, <clears throat> I was about to explain that. Oh, yeah, I'm losing my voice. Hold on. Yeah, me too, a little bit. I've got a cold. Yeah, I just came in from outside, so I'm... It, and it snowed here. Oh, it did? Oh, my God. It hasn't here yet. Just a dusting. Um, so, uh, yeah, I got the information for the first Grandy poster... Uh, in the in the evening, and it was delivered to the printer the next day. You so did I it? worked on it all night. Oh my gosh! And uh, you yeah. know, at, at Rob's kitchen table. Do you remember what you were paid for it by any chance? Um, twenty five bucks, I think. Wow. You know, twenty five dollars was like fifty dollars now. For sure. <laughs> but you must have been happy with it. I mean, it's, it's an incredible poster. Yeah, I was happy to get paid anything. Really. It was the first gig. And then basically, if I remember right, you did those posters, or most of them, until the time that you had to go to Boston or whatever, and then I think Carl did them, or someone else started doing them. Carl started doing them. uh, The the MC5 Gold poster was his first poster. Okay. And I um, don't have them in front of me. Let me turn the TV off here. Sure. Um, So, you know, he started because I was just overloaded with work. From the Grandy. From the Grandy, and also uh, working on the uh, Warren Forest Sun. Oh, that's right. Newspaper, because I was doing that, and John was keeping me busy with a whole bunch of things, and I just had a lot to do. When would this be about time-wise, if you can remember? This is uh, late 60s, early 67. There's a big uh, uh, weed bust in the neighborhood okay uh in january of 67 and um they arrested like 50 people but they let anybody everybody go except john oh so <laughs> because he had a prior yeah, yeah he had a prior and um he was the ringleader right so so they alleged 
Well, he probably was. Right. So uh, at that time, it, it kind of really shattered the community. Everybody was, uh, and I had already been planning at that time to go to San Francisco mm -hmm. with um, a, a school teacher that I uh, was, it was my girlfriend, mm -hmm. and she was a drama teacher, and she had a car, and she wanted to go to L.A., uh -huh. and I just wanted to go do something, so uh, we were planning on going, and uh, then then the bus happened, and um, and we weren't caught up in it. We were we were like out, out of the city at the time, mm -hmm. and so we just heard about it and um, decided it would be a good time to take off. So they weren't hunting for you. No. Okay. No, but I, was this when you went? This is not when you went. This is when you went to L.A. Right at that point. We went to L.A. and San Francisco. Right, and this is when you did that one poster. That for the, for the yeah, I, during uh, February and March, uh, I was in L.A. and San Francisco. I see, and uh, that's when I did those the poster for the uh, L.A. Lovin. Yeah, which is an incredible poster. <coughs> uh, yeah, I'm really happy with that. And I, I did a bunch of good posters. I had done like five, six posters previous to that uh, for the Grandy and um, gotten really good at it, you know, I thought. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I did I did a bunch of artwork then. This is out in L.A.? Or, or you talk about, I'm trying to separate what, what you did for the Grandy from, uh, from anything else. Trying to also try to get some date things set up here, which I'm not doing very well at. Well, the Grandy was uh, not a big success at first. Okay, yeah, I mean, I was there, right? And um, so well, their you, budget. Well, you for, didn't have name. You didn't have big acts. You had more local people. Right. And uh, um, Russ just cut way back on his um, budget for advertising. And, and printing. Okay. And so everything changed to flyers. Mm hmm And um, that's actually when when uh, when Carl Lundgren came on board, you know, to help me, you know, get flyers done. Right. And this was about when again? I'm trying to... Um, early 67. Okay, so like February, March... Yeah, uh, by I think by April I was back. Um, okay, so by April you were back, but w when you left, I'm trying to. So when did you when did you leave uh, Detroit and go to L.A. month wide? Um, it would be, be mid January. Okay, mid January. All right. right. I'm gonna by the next time we talk try to put this timeline together. Right. And I've got a rough one, but I don't have I don't have L.A. in it. I have all Michigan stuff in front of me. And, Suddenly, we're in L.A. So, in L.A., you did that that one incredible poster. What did you do? Other posters there that have been recovered or that are known? I, I don't think I have any of them. No, the main thing I did in L.A. was um, I was the art director of the L.A. Oracle. Ah, actually, we, we stopped in L.A. and she visited some friends of hers, and then we went to San Francisco, and I worked for the Oracle in San Francisco and did a bunch of work for them. And this uh, would have been about what months? This would be before April. This is in February. Okay, this is all in February. Wow. It's, uh, yeah. Now, some of those uh, Oracle things are republished. Is your stuff in there? I don't know if I... Right, there's a couple of issues that I did a lot of work. Okay. Do you, do you have them? I have the... Um, the reprint of all the Oracle issues. Okay, I think I want. Can't remember if I do or not, but I'll have to look. Um, okay, so that you did. So you were in San Francisco. You were in L.A. Then you went up or, or San Diego. I guess it was L.A. Then you went to San, uh, to San Francisco. And then at some point you decided to come back. Oh well, um, Gabe Katz, who is the art director for the San Francisco Oracle. And who is that? Gabe Katz. Last name K A T Z. Right. Okay. He uh, 
he got me the gig as, a, as the art director for the L.A. Oracle, because they had called him, mm -hmm. you know, to recommend an art director. So it was like starting from scratch, you know. I got down there, it was on an office on Fairfax, and nice big space, but there was no furniture and uh, no art supplies, and nothing, you know, mm -hmm. nothing to work with. And I kept bugging them for some cash. <laughs> And uh, they, were, they were busy with press conferences. Hmm. So what happened? What, what did you do? Did you, they finally got you some supplies? or? No, I, I, I screwed on, around there for a couple of weeks, and it just, I just got discouraged. Um, and in the meantime, they had found a, an, another art director hmm. when I was more in tune with the L.A. scene. I see. So they just kind of dumped you, or you just decided to move on? Uh, we just sort of mutually decided that it wasn't working. And so did they direct you up to the San Francisco one? Then? Or how did how did you get from there to San Francisco? To that Oracle? That was pretty easy. You just hop, <laughs> hop a ride. Uh, <laughs> okay, so but did they expect you, or did, you, did they give you an introduction, is what I'm trying to say, or did you go up and just introduce yourself? Well, I knew all the people at the San Francisco Oracle. Okay. And when I went to L.A., I had Gabe Katz's recommendation. Mm -hmm. So they knew me from the San Francisco Oracle. Okay, so they knew you already. Yeah, they knew me already. And um, I went back to San Francisco for a minute, but I didn't stay. Mm -hmm. um, I got there, first of all, right after the B-ins, and I did, they did all the layout for the sections that um, were about to be in. Mm -hmm. I was I got there like the day after the be in or something like that. Wow. So you were there just for not a long time and then you went back to Detroit. Right. In April. Right. Then what happened? So then you took back over from Carl or was Carl gonna be doing more anyway? Well I was I was happy to get any work so I, I started doing them all myself. Okay, so you were just had that kind of connection with Rush that if you were back, he's going to let you do them. Right. And Carl just took a back seat, or I don't know what the word is. It means he didn't didn't resent your coming back. No. I don't think I've ever met Carl, or if I do, I don't remember. Um, you know, I should probably... He's, he's still alive. He, oh, yeah. He's, he's um, <coughs> actually just moved a block away from where I used to live. Uh-huh. He's, he's down, uh... Is he friendly? Yeah, very much so. Yeah, maybe I should try to meet him sometime and interview him. Just to try to get his view of all this. Yeah, he's quite the, he's quite the artist. He's, he's got a whole studio set up at home, and he, he sells posters at shows uh, every weekend. Uh huh. And, um, you know, he's, he's, he really works hard at it. Yeah, but... Back then, he was most famous for the Vanessa poster. Right. That was the one that everyone wanted, just because it was, you know, a great poster. Right, and he, he's also a fine artist. Oh, he is. <laughs> a, a painter, and uh, he's got a career in uh, science fiction co book cover art. No kidding. And, um... Well, I, I knew some of those people way back in the early 60s. Frank Pizzetta type people. Right. And you never hear of someone called Larry Ivy? I knew used to stay at his apartment. That's been around 1960 or 61. No. But they were all, these are people that worked with Frazetta to oh. do some of his art or to fill stuff in and he finished it or something. I don't know. It's not important here. Okay, where, where are we next? Where do you, where do you want to go next with this? <coughs> Well, next. Well, next just means that you're back in Detroit. You're taking back over the Grandy. <coughs> right. I'm trying to look through my material to see whether I have any... You know, this is going to have to be iterative, meaning I'm going to have to go and gather my information and come back and get more detail. Right. Just because I don't have it all in mind. I, I have samples of all the work I did then. You do? Yeah, so... When you say samples, you mean the, the originals? 
Yeah, printed copies. Oh, great. Do, do you have a scanner? Yeah, I do. And maybe some, well, we'll look at it and see what I've got and what you've got. Maybe we want, you know, it's going to come down to when we do the book, uh, we're going to have to pick and choose what's representative. Right. We're not going to be able to do them. I mean, I have, I think, a thousand or nine hundred and some images of yours in my catalog. Wow. Which is a lot, which, you know, is just way more than Randy Tootin or any one of those people. But obviously, they, they won't be all in the book. Right. Even though I wish I could show everyone everything, but it doesn't work like that. So we'll have to take, and you'll be crucial there. What, are, what do you consider representative? I'm not asking you this minute. I'm saying that's what we'll have to figure out. And, right. Because uh, you not only produce posters, but you produce an enormous number of flyers. And I think that some of the work that you did for community is just incredible. I mean, right. That's a huge story in itself. And also I put out a newspaper. Which one was that? The, the, the Sun. Okay, so you did a lot of that work. Or how right, did you... in fact, I did all that work. <laughs> From the beginning? Uh, right. Okay, so uh, I think the Sun is coming online, right? Yeah, the Ann Arbor Library is uh, digitizing every issue and putting them all online. That's great. So I'll have a chance. You know, I guess it's coming up in the next couple of weeks. I'll be right. able to go on and look at some of those because I never had a lot of those access to even look at them. Yeah, they're very interesting. I, I uh, sold my collection because um, I just I knew they were, weren't going to last, uh-huh. and I wanted to sell them to somebody who's going to treat them well. That's right. So, um, <laughs> and I'm really happy that they're digitizing it too, so I can go back and look at it. That's right. And how long did the sun run? When did it begin? The sun began in um, uh, late '66. Okay, late '66. And when did it end? Uh, it ended in seventy. Five, I think, 76. When, when did your participation end? When did you, how long did you work on it? I worked on it through 71 or, or 73. Really? Yeah, I think 72 or 3 I quit. And so when you say worked on it, did you, were you the art director of it? Yeah. All that time? Uh, yeah. Well, that's an enormous amount of stuff. Yep. And it came out how often? Um, infrequently. Okay, <laughs> it, it was supposed to come out once a month, and then we thought, you know, well, it should be every two weeks, but we never did have a schedule. Okay. But just when we got an issue together, we put it out. Yeah, I can remember it, uh, but the, back then I wasn't monitoring stuff like this. And after we moved to Ann Arbor, it, it started um, in... Ken Kelly got involved. Mm-hmm. It, it became a, a weekly. Okay. And it was, came out every week. And you guys moved to Ann Arbor in '68, right? '69. Oh, '69. So that's you know, quite a bit later. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to see. '68, actually, I think late '68. The what? Let me see. Yeah, no, it was yeah, it was May of '68. Because when John moved, if you moved with him. Right. And what was that like? It wasn't like. Um, the way John describes it, if I remember properly, it was like the heat in Detroit got hot on you right. guys, and it was kind of like almost like an exodus. And Ann Arbor, of course, was Ann Arbor, and not the same deal. So, did you move with John? Did you all come at once? Um, no. I, as I remember, I had an apartment on Main Street with, with uh, Judy Janice. This is Ann Arbor Main Street. Right. But before John came or after John came? John uh, came in, according to him. I'm then. not certain who came first. Okay. But I think he came first, and then he got this big, beautiful house. He did. And, uh, you know, John, all my friends moved to Ann Arbor, so I did too. Okay, so you probably came a little bit later. Right. How, how tight or close were you? with Sinclair at that point? Uh, pretty close. Um, I was doing all their artwork, even when I wasn't living there. He gives you enormous credit when I talk to him. So you really were like a mainstay work, workhorse, right? Yeah, I was a member of the Central Committee and, and uh, attended all the meetings. 
And what was your title? I think you told Minister me. Minister of Art. Minister of Art, that's great. And what was John's title? What was he? Minister of what? Chairman. Chairman, that's all. Oh, that's right. Or Pharaoh, as you said. Right. And what did you think of Ann Arbor? How did Ann Arbor compare to Detroit? <laughs> oh, it's like heaven. <laughs> I mean, you liked it. Yeah, I liked it a lot. Did all the guys like it? I mean, all the Yeah, everybody guys... liked it. Yeah. And uh, and the heat was odd. They, you know, they didn't pursue you or whatever they were doing in Detroit, they didn't follow on into Ann Arbor. Or... Right. It was strictly a Detroit thing. And so they didn't go to the Ann Arbor police and say, watch out for these guys, or you don't know whether they did or not. Probably. Right. Or they, they may have, but, you know. They, they, the Ann Arbor police said, well, if they do something wrong, we'll, we'll, we'll see. That's right. And uh, I know there's a lot of stuff in here that I'm going to have to get my ducks in a row in order to ask you properly, but something that I'm just kind of curious about, from my point of view, the UAC Daystar stuff, that I think that Pete Andrews requisitioned is some of your most, uh, and that period, the early 70s, uh -huh. is some of your most beautiful stuff. I mean, it's just what I like, personally. Personally, to me, it's like, uh, unlike almost any other art of that time. Right. How did, uh, how did that come about? And I realize I'm kind of jumping, but I'm going to have to because I don't have, well, you know, I don't have... I'm going to have to merge a couple databases so that I can see everything at once, and I can't. Yeah, it's all right to jump around. Um, okay, thanks. Um, Peter Andrews, let's see. And when did you meet him, and how? what did you think of him? When I met him, it must have been 65, uh -huh. he knew no music. He was as square as it could be. Right. <laughs> and I'm curious whether you had that impression, or had, by the time you met him, he had learned, I don't know, the lingo or whatever. I didn't meet him until after 71. Oh, okay. And so, you know, he, he had long hair and he was uh, doing the Day, Day, Day Star posters. Yeah, the UAC Day Star. So he was, he was well into the music business by the time I met him. Okay, so then he, he was kind of hip then. Yeah. Then, and, but, and how did you come to do, how, how did you come to do so many of those? Did well, I was the only person who was able to do it. Uh, there were other artists who, who I gave work to, like Mike Brady and Greg Sobrin and uh, a couple others, but um, they, they would all get all excited and bent out of shape by the deadlines and, and uh, not, you know, not produce it. And so how did you meet? You met probably him through his meeting John. Right, I think I met him through John and David Sinclair. Okay. Just as as a business partner, you know, they just introduced him as this guy we're working with, you know. Okay. And he's got a poster job for you, so. Uh, oh, oh, in this case, the poster job was the UAC Daystar stuff. Right. And what did they pay you, if you have any memory? More than more than they than the Grandy Barham paid by at least two or three times, but. I never saw the money, so... You mean he never paid you? Well, he oh, never no, no, paid you me. Paid he paid John. The White Panther Party. I, I was the White Panther. So you didn't negotiate the fee? No. Ah, okay. Well, Peter probably remembers. Right. Oh, I see. So you really were working for the party. Right. Exactly. I, I did... They, the party supported me. They gave me a place to live and fed me and bought me clothes and stuff. And... Uh, and I didn't have to worry about money. I mean, if you needed something, John would see you got it or something. Right. Or Dave. Oh, right. And, and uh, they would, in turn, represent me to the world, you know, and charge people for my work. Well, that makes sense. Really, what other businesses do. Just right. unusual business. And then and Peter would just... Peter knew that you would do what needed to be done. I mean, the, right. did, did he think ahead or did he... Was it always a rush, rush kind of thing? No, no, it wasn't, wasn't Robert rushed. He was very good about, uh, you know, planning things out. And sometimes he, he'd get a little behind and, and you know, the, I, I'd feel a, a deadline pressure, but not that much. Not like the Grandy. Oh, right. The Grandy was like a, just hectic. Like overnight. Right. And, and Daystar didn't do as many shows as the Grandy Barroom did. 
They didn't have to keep the doors open. And was Peter also doing not just stuff on the U of M campus? Was he also, I see you did a lot of work in, you know, Ypsilanti and some of the other colleges around the state. Was that all through Peter? Uh, the ones in, in Eastern Michigan University were done through um, a different group of people who ran, who worked directly for the university and had their own office there. University of Eastern Michigan. Right. Oh, I see. Okay. But, but, uh, Peter did uh, Central Michigan University and and a bunch of other state universities throughout the state. So um, there, there was a mix of schools that I that I did posters for. Okay, so that w I'm trying to take a quick look here. What what I've got here? Um, hang on one second. Like Grimshaw, seventies. Um, looking at this. Okay, so stuff like Bowen Fieldhouse would have come through them. Through Eastern Michigan, yeah. yeah. And then, uh, what about the park? That was uh, handled by David Sinclair, and uh, there was a group of people in Ohio that um, just called up on the phone. You know, mm -hmm. I never went to, to the park. I never yeah, saw the facility. There. Uh huh. But um, the, I played there a couple times, and, and uh, the people in the White Panther House were familiar with the place, and. You know, said it was cool, so it was good enough for me. <laughs> I see. Um, what about places like the Finchfield House in Central Michigan, things like that? That's that's all Pete. That's all. Oh, that was Pete. Yeah. And how about uh, Toledo Sports Arena? Uh, and Boy Dukes, the Atomic Rooster one. I think that was also Pete. I'm not sure, but I'm I, I'm pretty sure it was Pete. And the IMA Auditorium? Pete. That's Pete. Um, what about Grand Valley Field House? That's uh, also Peter. Okay, so he did a lot of it. <coughs> yeah. But if we go to something like the Detroit Rock and Roll Revival, that's before all this. How did right, that was in 69. And that was a Rust thing. Right. Yeah, so um, what about Pease Auditorium? That's Eastern Michigan. Oh, that's the same thing. That's just another thing. What about the um, Mount Clemens Pop Festival? Just jumping around. Mount Clemens Pop Festival. Um, that was the one with all the type. The black one with kind of purple type on it. David Dubois presents. Um, yeah, I, I, that was like a one shot. and um, So it just came up somehow. It just came up out of nowhere and... and uh, Disappeared into nowhere. <laughs> it's a wonderful poster. Yeah, you know, it's, uh, it's it's. Uh, I, I think it's kind of ugly, but you do. Well, no, what, what's ugly about it? Just the colors. I, I don't think the color worked. I do think it works. I disagree. Just the use of the green in it. If you can remember what it looks like. Yeah, I can remember. It's wonderful. I mean, there's almost very few artists that have your sense of color, and almost none. Maybe Tootin is one that are not ashamed or afraid to use color in large areas. Right. Uh, and as I, I've told you so many times that what you did during the UAC years, the Daystar years, whether it was for them directly or for someone else, what were you thinking when you were producing those? Things like the I Can Teener poster with the roses or, um, you know, just any number of them, uh, the Curtis Mayfield or the... Gordon Lightfoot or James Taylor, all those ones that have large bodies of color, and then, you know, you're, you're kind of writing. Were you aware, what were you thinking, if I can even ask this question, what were you thinking about your own work? Do you, were you aware that it was so wonderful, or was it just work? I mean, you must have enjoyed making those. Yeah, at the time that I did them, I was also uh, the art director for the White Panther Party, and I, I did a lot of artwork for many different things. And uh, the posters were just part of the workflow. So I didn't have any specific thoughts about the posters as opposed to everything else. Um, it was just a bunch of work that I enjoyed doing. I, I, had, a, I had a ball then. It looks like it. I mean, that's what it looks like. It looks like, you know, most people are aware of your grandy stuff. And there's, you know, all kinds of stuff 
talk and writing about that. But, uh, you know, I, I can't think of more than a handful, if that many, people who even know your UAC Daystar stuff. And I don't know how they could not, if they knew it, how they could not be enthused about it. Mm -hmm. So what do you think of that? How could, what, where are these guys at that, 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 they, that they're, they didn't hunt it out like I tried to do? I mean, how, why wasn't there more appreciation of that period? Not that you would know. I'm just curious whether you have any thoughts on it. Well, at the time that I was doing them, I was living in Ann Arbor, and the events were not, in, you know, the events weren't in Detroit. Right. So, and I wasn't in Detroit. So Detroiters kind of, you know, weren't, weren't there per se, to, to see them. Right. And, and so it wasn't a part of their experience, and so they consequently don't uh, think about them. But then when they see them, they, they really are impressed, you know. Well, we're 40 years later, and there's uh, all kinds of poster people, but even in poster dumb, in all those people, I haven't, you know, even people like Eric King, not that enthused, right? Just because it hasn't been set up maybe so clearly as a collectible, do you think that's it? It certainly isn't the art. It's not like the art is not as good. You know, I, think I think if all of them were put together on like a, a, a brochure or some sort of printed way so you can see them all, right? that, that it, you know, just the, the sheer volume of it um, would be very impressive. Well, you're going to see a lot of them Friday. Yeah, that's what I, I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. But these are just the ones I happen to still have. I had all of them almost. But unfortunately, like you would understand better than I did, I had to sell them. It's just horrible. It makes me sick. All right. But at the same point, there were things that just were in the cabinet. I never really saw them anymore because you didn't want to touch them much and all that kind of stuff. But right. it kind of makes me sad. But... Yeah, you'll see things like the Cur Curtis Mayfield and the um, James Taylor and, and uh, Herbie Hancock and a lot of those. Mm -hmm. um, good. Yeah, they look good. And I have a couple other ones. You know, I have the one of the. I think I have the second Freedom Rally poster. Um, and I have some of my own as well, just from my own band, which doesn't compare to yours, but still, they're different. Right. You know, there's nothing wrong with them. Um, okay. Any thoughts come into your mind? I'm trying to think of... Um, what I'm learning is that I need to to do more patient here to, to know what... I, I'm just kind of jumping around because... That's all right. Satisfying my own curiosity. I, I'd also like to get into, at some point, over this series of interviews that we'll do, your whole spiritual thing. I know that, that you like astrology and know quite a bit about it. Uh -huh. Of course, I've spent, what, 50 years on it. Just your whole spiritual thing, how that relates. I mean, were all of the uh, White Panther people spiritually oriented? Or were you a standout? I mean, you've always talked pretty spiritually to me. Um, Just, uh, how prevalent was that? It was pretty prevalent in the, in the party. I mean, it, it really was a bunch of hippies, you know? <laughs> It was more a, a, a group of hippies than it was a, a revolutionary party. So, so everyone knew some astrology. Yeah, but you, you seem to know a fair amount of it. At least we never really talked about it seriously, but it's something that interests you or did. Yes. And you, do you remember doing that piece for Matrix Software? Yes, I, I do. I still have that. Um, and what other what other spiritual directions would, have you studied or been in, open to? Aside from everything, is there, I mean, did you take an interest in Buddhism or uh, Hinduism or any 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 of the things that were all around us back then? Well, I'm, I'm interested in in Zen Buddhism, mm -hmm. the Japanese version of it, um, and, and Buddhism of in general is interesting to me. And have you done any practicing? Did you ever start to do meditation and? go through some of the systematic stuff they especially Zen does uh, no actually I haven't I haven't you know used it as a, a jumping off for self-discipline um, 
it, I, I just think of it intellectually, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, it just, uh, of, of all the major religions, Buddhism makes the most sense to me. Well, me too. And uh, what, what about, and this is maybe too personal, but what about with as sick as you've been in the last couple of years? And coming really close to death. Uh -huh. Any? What is your thought there? Any interest in like learning more about what's over there, or what or what the Buddhists have to say about that, or or, or have you just had your own experiences? Well, I, I think my lifelong interest in Buddhism has helped me a lot in dealing with this because I, I know whatever happens, it's going to be cool. <laughs> right. You know, I, I'm not afraid of death let's put it that way right in fact I, I think it might be nicer than being alive <laughs> but you know I'm not in a hurry to find out no so uh, I just I'm, I'm just letting nature take its course and and uh, trying to live as long as I can but not you know manically and when you went to Boston back in that period when and studied some macrobiotics did you actually study macrobiotics? Oh, yeah. I, I went to Misho Kushi's lectures yeah. a couple times a week, and uh, I ate pretty strictly macrobiotic. Did what, you study? What, what of that remains? What, does any of that remain? I mean, I also studied it. I also met Misho Kushi, and he did you know, examine me and did all this stuff. It's been a huge importance to me, just in terms of how I think about food. Right. You still have that? I still have that background. I still have that same knowledge of food, and um, you know, and I behold into the idea of eating less. And of course, now uh, the situation's different where I'm trying to force myself to eat. But I got out of the habit of eating mm -hmm. over the years, and and. Uh, you know, now I have to... Have to work at it. Have to work at it, yeah. The rest of us are just the opposite. <laughs> Mostly trying to... Uh, I've got to figure it out myself pretty soon, too, if I want to keep on living. Just um, my body wasn't made to carry a lot of weight. Right. We look good, too. I'm pretty good for 70. Right. But, uh, okay, anyway, I'm straying off. I'm just... These are just kind of curious... Uh, uh, you know what I was trying, what I was talking about was just what, what, what spiritual things you know kind of stood you good, stead, like you know, like you mentioned Zen Buddhism, and did you ever sit in Sashin or anything like that? No. So you just like you're basically conceptual with it, right? And and that's been an inspiration just on its own, right? Any other things like that? Any other spiritual? Uh, Either you grew up with it or something that, that you turned to? Mm, not really. I mean, I'm like you. I mean, I'm into Buddhism. Um, yeah, I, I don't have and zero religious training. So uh, you, did, you weren't raised in any faith? No. Oh, I, My parents never went to church. But what were they originally? Um, my father's family was Church of England. And I don't know what my mother's family was. So, I, and it's irrelevant because they they didn't have any religious training either. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm like second, third generation <laughs> so just, of no religious training whatsoever. So, so, so I, I don't even think about Christianity as a major religion, you know. You. To me, it's a minority religion. Now, how do you figure that? Because in this country, it's pretty majority. Well, majority here, but here... Oh, in the world, you mean? In the world. It's not the world, you know. Totally true. That's absolutely <coughs> true. Yeah, so you're aware of that. Yeah. Oh, me too. I mean, I'm... Totally Christianity is pretty primitive, too. All, all of the... Uh, the history of Christianity is... Pretty weird. Brutal. Brutal. Yeah, well, I... I mean, I'm I'm all about Asia myself, right? And have been for a long, long time. And just Asian psychology, especially, is like so far ahead of Western psychology, which is so primitive. 
Right. I'm still stinging from, I'm older than you are, and came up through the 50s when all the psychologists were, you know, telling us that the way that we were being described is as, you know, like paranoid, schizophrenic. There, there were no, we weren't told that we're good or that our essence was good. We were told that, you know, one thing by the Christians, we were told that, you know, we're, our nature is sin, right? We're sinners. And then by the psychology, we told us that we were one of all these things. You know, we were manic, depressive, or paranoid, or schizophrenic. So it was very hard for me, and this is not about me, so I want to get off this topic, to overcome it. Right. And, to find, and that's what astrology did for me. Right. It gave me a, a second opinion on who I was. And of course, Buddhism is like much greater than that, just because the core of, in Buddhism isn't original sin, the core of Buddhism is, your, is Buddha nature, which we all share. And right. 100% positive, and the only thing is the outside obscurations need to be polished or taken away. Right. To me, that was like, wow. <laughs> you know, could I be that lucky that I could think that way? Because I was raised Catholic, so constantly made to be ashamed of myself and anything I would have done as a kid, especially as a guy, you know, anyway, all that kind of stuff. Uh, no, I, I had nothing to do with the Catholic Church, and, and uh, I went, went to high school at the uh, uh, mainly Polish neighborhood of Detroit, and so most, most of my friends and were very much into religious training. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know I had a friend Carl Sigalone who was um, very Catholic his family was I don't know if he was but he, he was uh, really it, it was child abuse you know I, I hmm. it's the only way I can describe that's it that's a great way I've never heard that before but I, I totally instinctively agree and and uh, that's the, the, re, the repressed nature of young people is was so strong, you know, due to, due to the fact it was a, a severely Catholic neighborhood. Right. And, um, yeah, it, it, and it's funny now because I, I, I kind of enjoy the Catholic Church. I mean, I like their, their views on, um, you know, freedom and, and, uh, economic um, views I think I think they they um, speak well of you know, poor people and underprivileged and are helping people to overcome their difficulties but you know that's they're sort of getting back to the original teachings of Jesus but um, still they still have this um, formal structure that's just repressive and crude. Totally. You know? Well, my takeaway from the Catholic Church, the good part, was just the mystery tr tradition that they, the one thing that they have that the Protestants don't have is a, a sense of mystery and awe. Right. And that's something that, you know, <coughs> I, I just drank in. I mean, that, and so did the Tibetans. Uh, so. That was the one good thing that came out of that. I had to go to Catholic school and be an altar boy and learn the church Latin and, you know, be terrified by the priests and stuff, mm -hmm. you know, who take us into, into the, you know, to the church, to the, to the altar and, and just the boys and then tell us that if we ever masturbated or did anything, we're going to hell. <laughs> so we would kind of look sideways at each other. We were all going to hell, I'll tell you that. <laughs> right. Because... That was so stupid. You well, know. they want, they wanted to build guilt into you, you know. Well, it just is like such bad psychology. Yeah, it is. I mean, that's when you said crude or or brutal. I mean, right. It's just really crude. And I, I feel that way about Western psychology in general. Right. It's just ultimately crude compared to Buddhist psychology, which is so subtle, at least to us, because we don't have anything like it. But anyway, um, yeah, all, all I can say is, but I do feel sorry for Protestants that they didn't get the mystery part, that they, that they don't have a sense of awe of the universe that, that I think Catholics do. Maybe the one good thing, but anyway. 
textures. The thing that I like, that I wish you had more, you know, had a better color copy of it, and I think the original's in, in the Bentley, is that, uh, that billboard, which I think you said it, was, it reminded you maybe of a Broico piece or something like that. Right. Where everyone is partying and dancing and stuff, you know, I, right. think, I think that is the artist. Um, but that I would have loved to see. I never saw the whole thing. That must have been quite something to see. Yeah. When they got it up, um, it reminds me of you know Bob Freed's <coughs> Behind the Beyond billboard that he did, which is one of his best pieces. Do you know that image? Oh yeah. Yeah, I love that. I've got one of his posters of it. Well, there you have it. That's most of the interview with Gary Grimshaw. Perhaps a little more than you needed, but we got into some of the details. Plus, you had a chance to see some of his major posters. I hope you've enjoyed it. Unfortunately, Gary passed away on Monday, January 13, 2014. He will be missed, but his remarkable art and spirit still are with us, and they live on. <laughs>